My lords, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the stage the President of the Royal Academy of Engineering, Professor Dayman Dowling. Good morning, my lords, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Royal Academy of Engineering on this very special day that will see the winner of the 2015 Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, Dr. Robert Langer, receive his award from Her Majesty the Queen. Since its inception four years ago, the QE Prize has grown in stature and is fast becoming the equivalent of a Nobel Prize for Engineering. As President of the Royal Academy of Engineering, I'm proud that we host the QE Prize team and that many of our fellows are contributing to the success of the QE Prize as trustees, as judges, or as members of international search groups, as well, of course, as public supporters and as winners. Lord Brown, Chairman of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation, and one of my predecessors as president of the Academy, revealed the decision to award the QE 2015 prize to Dr. Langer here in this very room in the Academy in February. Coverage of that announcement reached an incredible worldwide audience, audience of 600 million people. And I hope that many of those people and also the young engineers today here with us will be inspired by Dr. Langer and also by the five internet pioneers who won the inaugural Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering in 2013. We want them to be inspired to enable the engineering's next generation to meet the challenges of the future. Uh, to introduce Dr. Langer, Please welcome to the stage the Chairman of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation, Lord Brown. Uh, thank you, Anne. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and, and a particular welcome to Bob Langer and to his family. It's very tremendous to see you all here. It's a very great pleasure to be back at the Royal Academy of Engineering. Engineering is uh, humanity's greatest enabler. It's the best tool we possess for advancing human progress, from our health to the global environment, and from the infrastructure of mega cities to the development of the world's poorest rural communities. We couldn't do without the creativity and innovation of brilliant engineering minds. The scope of engineering is far reaching and the goalposts are constantly shifting. With each leap forward, a new challenge arises, and we discover that the world needs new solutions to serve more people. It takes encouragement and support to keep engaging the world's best minds in these pursuits. And that's why the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering is so very important. It celebrates what's been achieved, it praises those who have been successful, and it spurs on others in the pursuit of excellence. We're here today to congratulate this year's winner of the Queen Elizabeth Prize, Dr. Robert Langer. His groundbreaking work on the controlled delivery of large molecule drugs has transformed treatments for cancer and mental illness. He's inspired the students that have worked with him many of whom have gone on to become leaders in their fields. And his work has opened up new fields of research in wireless drug delivery, regenerative medicine, and the delivery of genetic drugs using nanotechnology. Dr. Langer is an example of the talent, creativity, and dedication required to change the world. His, his achievements have made an indispensable contribution to human progress. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Robert Langer.
Well, thank you so much. I am just so, feel very so privileged to be here today and to receive this magnificent award. I, I thought probably the best thing I could do is tell you a little bit about my life and career. Uh, and it certainly has not been a straightforward path to coming here today. You know, I grew up in Albany, New York. My dad uh, ran a small liquor store. And he worked really, really hard. But when he came home, he'd always play math games with me. My mom, my mother, Mary, she was a homemaker. And she took care of my sister, Kathy, uh, who's here today, and myself. And my mother actually worried all the time. Actually, she still does. But uh, <laughs> I think she's probably worried about me now. But, uh, and, but she, she, she was and is one of the nicest people you could ever meet. And I hope a little bit of that rubbed off on me. You know, when I was a little boy, I'd get all kinds of like presents for my birthday and uh, like baseballs and footballs. But when I was about 10 or 11, I actually also got these uh, erector sets. And, and here's an example of me playing with one when I was little, uh, a microscope set and a chemistry set. And I really, they were these called Gilbert sets. And I really loved them. I would make uh, robots and rocket launchers with the erector set. I'd watch shrimp hatch with the microscope. And I set up a little lab uh, with the chemistry set in the basement of our small house in Albany. And I'd mix different chemicals together. And I loved magic. And I watched, liked watching them turn different colors. So in high school, uh, I wasn't actually very good in classes like English and French. Um, but I did well in science and math. So when I was ready to apply to college, my dad and my guidance counselor said, well, I should become an engineer. And, and, and actually, that really didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time. I, I thought engineers ran railroad cars. I, I really did. And, and I was, but I, I, um, I, I, but I, as I learned more about it, it sounded to me like it would be a great profession. And so I decided to apply to a number of engineering schools. And I was uh, lucky enough to be accepted to Cornell University. And my freshman year, chemistry is my favorite subject uh, by far, and I decided to major chemical engineering. Um, but what happened was is that uh, when I got done, I got job offers to work in like different chemical plants. And I wasn't, didn't think I'd be very good at it. I'm pretty sure I was right. Um, and, and so I decided to apply to graduate school. And I was lucky enough to get an MIT. I finished graduate school with a doctorate in chemical engineering. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But there were just enormous number of, of traditional job offers for chemical engineers at that time. I, so I applied to these different jobs. I actually got 20 job offers. But I wasn't excited about them. And I started to think more and more about what I wanted to do with my life. And this is something, you know, as a young person that I expect a lot of people, young people in the audience go through. So, so I figured out, as I started thinking about this, what I did want to do. And I didn't certainly have an exact idea, but I did know that what I did want to do was to use my background in chemistry and chemical engineering to improve in people's lives. And one of the things that I did is I'd spent a lot of time as a graduate student while I was supposed to be doing my thesis, uh, starting a school for poor high school kids and developing new chemistry and math curricula. And one day, I saw an ad to be an assistant professor uh, to develop chemistry curricula at City College in New York. So I wrote them a letter applying for a job to be assistant professor, but they didn't write me back. But I really liked the idea, so I found all the ads I could to be an assistant professor at some college to develop chemistry curricula. And I um, wrote about 40 letters, and actually none of them wrote me back. <laughs> so that wasn't going real well. <laughs> so then another way I started to think about that I might be able to help people was through health-related research. So I actually applied to a lot of hospitals and medical schools. And none of them wrote back either. <laughs> and then one day, one of the people in the lab where I work said I should write to a surgeon named Judah Folkman at Harvard. Uh, they said sometimes he hired unusual people. <laughs> and Dr. Folkman was kind enough to offer me a job. So actually, what I did is I took at the time what seemed to, like all chemical engineers, like a huge risk. And I started doing postdoctoral work in a hospital. That might seem more common today, but at that time in the 1970s, few of any uh, chemical engineers did work in a surgery lab before. In fact, I was the only engineer in the hospital. Um, the projects I began working on involved two kind of related projects. First, I was trying to discover really the first substances that could stop cancer blood vessels from growing 
uh, to the tumors. And the thought was, is if we could do this, maybe that would be a whole new way to stop tumors from growing. But tied to that, was that we also had to develop ways of giving these molecules. And so the second area that I began working on was developing polymer systems that might be able to slowly release these and other large molecular weight substances for a very, very long time in the body. It was kind of basic research to solve this problem of blood vessel growth, but that's how I got started. But before I worked on this problem, no one had been able to develop ways to continuously release these kinds of substances for a long time from polymers. And in fact, scientists and engineers at that time thought it wasn't possible to do. Um, you know, they kind of thought it was like somebody walking through a wall. In fact, sometimes I say the only thing that I had really going for me at that time is I just hadn't read all the literature telling me that it was impossible. <laughs> so I tried anyhow. And actually, I spent two years working on the project uh, experimenting with different techniques, and I actually found over 200 different ways to get this to not work. <laughs> but, but finally, I, I, I made a discovery that I could modify certain types of polymers and use them to slowly release these molecules. And then we used these, these polymers to create these assays that enabled us to discover the first substances that could stop these cancer blood vessels and help stop cancer. Just as an aside, it took 28 years from our earliest publication in this area, which was in science, until the FDA approved the first blood vessel inhibitor. But today, these types of drugs are among the most successful new biopharmaceuticals for treating a whole range of diseases like types of blindness, like macular degeneration and cancer and so forth. And, and here's just a slide showing some of them uh, over the last uh, 10 years. They um, basically, They've now been used to treat over 20 million patients, and regulatory authorities like the US FDA now say there are four ways to treat cancer, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, and stopping blood vessel growth. And of course, many times these therapies are, are used together. About, about two years after I started working on this polymer project, I still remember this, that I was asked to give a talk to a very distinguished audience of chemicals, chemists and engineers in Michigan. And I'd never given a big talk before, in fact, the last talk I had given was in eighth grade, and I had to give a 90-second speech. And I still remember the uh, night before that eighth grade talk, I rehearsed that talk for four hours in my parents' bedroom in front of a mirror. And then the next day, I started to give the talk, but after a minute of speaking, I couldn't remember the next word, and I just froze. And I didn't bring something like this to look down on. So eventually, I just I stood up there for another minute, just uh, saying absolutely nothing, until my eighth grade teacher finally told me to sit down and gave me a, a not very good grade. It was actually an F. Uh. <laughs> so, so now, when this Michigan talk came about many years later, I was very nervous, and I stopped working two weeks in advance of the talk, and I kept practicing my talk over and over into a tape recorder until finally the day came. And I got up, and I gave that talk, and I was actually pretty pleased by the end of it. I didn't forget too much for what I wanted to say, and I didn't stammer too much. And so I thought when I was done with this talk that all these much older distinguished chemists and engineers being nice people and would want to encourage me, this young guy. But when I got done, a whole bunch of them came up to me uh, and gathered around me, and they said, well, we don't believe anything you just said. <laughs> they kind of said what the literature said. They said, we know you can't get these molecules you're talking about to slowly diffuse through these polymers. And, and really, it took several years before various groups started repeating what we did. And then the question shifted to how could this possibly happen? Uh, what could be the mechanism? And in fact, I spent a good part of my early career at MIT trying to understand how polymer drug delivery systems functioned, getting at mechanisms uh, uh, and, uh, which had to do with very complex tortuous winding paths in these systems, and then trying to make them useful for different applications. Also, I should say that shortly after that talk, I tried to receive funding to support my research. And so what you do is you have to write uh, uh, grants. And I wrote many grants. In fact, I still remember that my first nine grants were rejected. In fact, I remember I wrote one grant to the National Institutes of Health in the United States for some of the cancer research I was doing. And I remember I got the reviews back, and they were incredibly negative. They not only like turned me down, 
But they said, well, how could Dr. Langer do this? He's a chemical engineer. He doesn't know anything about biology, and he knows even less about cancer. I, I wasn't sure how that was possible, but, you know, to know less than nothing. But anyhow, that's what they said. So also, when I was done with my postdoctoral work, I applied for faculty positions in a number of chemical engineering departments. But I had trouble getting faculty jobs then because people felt at the time that what I was doing wasn't engineering. They thought it was more like biology. So I ended up joining what was then the Nutrition and Food Science Department at MIT. But what happened there was the year after I got that job, the chairman of the department, who was really the key person to, uh, hiring me, left. And then a number of the senior faculty in the department decided to give me advice. And their advice was that I should start looking for another job. <laughs> another thing, though, that, that I remember thinking about was, you know, and Dr. Folk and I, we were interested in getting a patent. That was very unusual at the time uh, at a hospital. In fact, the hospital where I worked had no patents. Uh, so we filed for a patent in 1976, and the patent office turned it down. In fact, they turned it down five times uh, over the next five years. And the lawyer for the hospital told me I should just give up and, you know, because I was cost costing the hospital a lot of money. But I, I never liked to give up that easily, so I started to think of ways, you know, that we could get the patent. And the patent examiner said that what we'd done was obvious, um, but I knew that wasn't true, as I mentioned, because lots of people told us it was impossible. And, you know, I was trying to think, how could we convince the examiner to allow the patent, you know, legally, of course. So I, I kept scouring the literature to see if I could find anything that might be useful. And I found um, a paper published by five very famous chemists and engineers in 1979 that referred to our work. And if we could just go to this. And, and what they wrote was, and I'll, I'll just read it to you, but they basically just wrote describing the field that generally the agent to be released is a relatively small molecule with a molecular weight no larger than a few hundred. One would not expect that macromolecules, for example, proteins, could be released by such a technique because of their extremely small permeation rates through polymers. However, Folkman and Langer have reported some surprising. Surprising was really the key word for the examiner. Uh, I had no idea this was written. That clearly demonstrate the opposite. So I showed this to our lawyer, and he said, gee, that's very interesting. And he flew down to the patent examiner to show him this. And the patent examiner said, you know, I didn't realize this. They said, I tell you what, I will allow this patent if Dr. Langer can get affidavits, the written documents, uh, from each of these five people that they really wrote that. <laughs> it's it's, it's a, a true story. So I, um, I, I wrote them, and they were nice enough to tell me they really wrote it, and we got this very broad patent. And, and then we licensed it to two very large companies, multi-billion dollar companies, one in animal health and one in human health. And both companies gave us grant money and, and promised to do experiments to help our invention, which I was very excited about. But what happened is even though I got grant money and even consulting money, they, they didn't do that many experiments. They just, you know, again, it was our thing. It wasn't theirs. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons why I began starting a small company. And so I did this with Alex Klebanoff, and we started a little company called Enzatec, and later that merged to become a company called Alchemies. And today, like, they have many, many products in the market, as do others. This is just a slide of uh, some of the different products that you can use making these techniques. But these are often little microspheres that you can inject, and they could last anywhere. They're underneath the skin, and they can deliver the drug anywhere from like a few hours to six months, depending on the drug. But, but basically what we've seen is that these have lead, led to new treatments for uh, prostate cancer, um, uh, schizophrenia, alcoholism, type 2 diabetes, and, and, and many other diseases. Uh, also, it, it, it was just sort of the tip of the iceberg for me. It led me to get interested in smart, starting other small companies. We've now, with our students, done about 30 companies, and also, you know, later on I started thinking, you know, you could not only use microspheres, but maybe we could make them much smaller, like nanospheres, and try to get them to go right to where you want, the cells in the body, like a tumor. And actually, what I'm going to show to explain this to you is a video that the TV show Nova made on what we did. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That, in turn, 
gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. I should say a lot of the clinicians I work with tell me it doesn't blow the cell up quite like that. <laughs> So, so, so another area I started uh, thinking about involved creating new materials. And one of the things I noticed as an engineer working in the hospital was that ev almost every material that was used in medicine were driven by clinicians who, who just would go to their house and find an object they wanted to use on a person. So for example, if you look at the artificial heart, th those are the materials that are used in a lady's girdle because the clinicians wanted something with a good flex life. But the problem is, is once blood hits the surface of the artificial heart, the lady's girdle material it could form a clot and could go to the patient. That clot goes to the patient's brain. They get a stroke and they could die. Another example is breast implants. One of those was actually a mattress stuffing. And so I started thinking, you know, why couldn't we use engineering approaches? Why couldn't we make this like a design problem and ask the question, what do we really want in a material from an engineering standpoint, chemistry standpoint, and biology standpoint, and then synthesize them from first principles. And so to address this, I actually thought about trying to create a new family of polymers, which we call polyanhydrides, for medical use. And this involved actually a, a number of steps. But the first step was to pick what we call the building blocks, the monomers of the polymer. And here I asked uh, one of my friends, Michael Marletta, who was then at MIT, now is a chaired professor at UC Berkeley, what list of substances we thought might make good polymers. And then we synthesized them. And we found that by changing the compositions, we could actually make polymers last from you know, a few days to many years uh, just by changing the, the, the chemistry and the engineering of them. But then what happened was one day in the, about 1985, Henry Brem, who was a good friend of mine, he's now chief of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, asked me, well, what, could we come up with a new way of thinking about treating brain cancer? Could we use polymers to locally deliver the drug uh, to a tumor? But whenever you come up with an idea like this, you have to raise money, so I'd write grants. And, I, uh, and they get reviewed by what are called these study sections, which are professors at other places. And we did actually terribly. Um, I remember, this is a slide I made from taking some of the reviews. So when we first uh, wrote this um, in 1981, the reviewer said we could never synthesize the polymers. But I had a very good graduate student, Howie Rosen, Howie uh, later became president of ALSA, a $12 billion company, and uh, actually has been elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and he synthesized them. So then uh, we sent the grant back, and the, the reviewer said the polymers, they'll react, they'll react with whatever drug we put in. But I had another uh, graduate, another postdoc, Cam Lee Young, he now is a chaired professor at, Cornell, at Columbia University, also has been elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and, and he actually showed that that didn't happen. So then um, we sent it back again, and the reviewer said, well, the polymers will break because they're low molecular weight. But I had another couple of postdocs, Avi Dome, uh, who later became chair of medicinal chemistry at the Hebrew University, and Edith Mathiewicz, who's now a full professor at Brown University and has been elected to the National Academy of Inventors. And uh, they uh, showed that they could make polymers very strong. Sent it back again, and the reviewer said, but the polymers will be toxic. That's 1986. But I had another graduate student, Cato Lorenzen, who's also been elected to National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine. And he later became Dean of Medicine at the University of Connecticut. And he showed that they were actually very safe in animals. Sent it back again. And the reviewer said, well, the drug can't diffuse far enough to kill remaining tumor. So I had another graduate student, Mark Saltzman. Mark actually is chair of biomedical engineering at Yale, has been elected to the National Academy of Medicine. And he showed that they did. So this kept going on, uh, diffuse far enough. So this kind of negative re reviews kept going on for a long time. But in 1996, the FDA actually approved this treatment uh, in spite of those reviews. It was the first time in more than 20 years they approved a new treatment for brain cancer. And the first time they ever approved this concept of polymer-based local chemotherapy. You can probably tell from the way I'm speaking that I'm very proud of how well our graduate students and postdocs have done. They became heads of major corporations, very successful professors at top universities, deans, and so forth. The reviewers, they, they unfortunately haven't done so well. <laughs> um, 
I, 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 and, and, and actually, we get people sometimes ask, where did we get the funding? And we got the funding, actually, based on our patents. Uh, uh, not, I mean, we've actually, the NIH has been very good to us, but in this case, the, uh, we, we did get funding because a company licensed our patents and gave us money to develop them. And now, 19 years after their approval, these polymer systems are still used for treating brain cancer patients in over 30 countries and provided a whole new paradigm in the drug delu delivery field, helping pave the way for, say, drug-eluting stents, which are used in millions of patients, and, and many other local uh, delivery systems. In one last example that I just wanted to go over about our work, Jay Vacanti, who's a friend of mine and a surgeon at Mass General, and I had this idea in the early eight, 1980s to create three-dimensional synthetic polymer scaffolds with cells including stem cells, which would come later, to create new tissues and organs. And once again, this idea met with a lot of skepticism. It was difficult to obtain grants. But uh, eventually, we were able to get some funding. And today, this concept has become a cornerstone of what we call tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. And it's led to the creation, for example, of new skin for patients who are burned. And I thought I would just show you an example of that. Here is a little boy who's very badly burned. But there's a product now that you can take, which is cells on a scaffold. You can put it on the little boy at time zero. But if you come back three weeks later, he's doing better. And six months later, he's pretty much healed. And these are actually now, and, and we're working a tremendous amount on this, these kinds of principles are, are now being explored at earlier stages to help patients who are, are paralyzed, uh, who have, need vocal cord repair, uh, to create new cartilage, to create new pancreas. Virtually someday, I hope it'll be possible to create any nutrition or, or organ using these kinds of ideas. And there's great work going on in England here and many other places. Finally, I, I just want to add a little bit about my personal life. I've been very, very lucky. I've been married for over 27 years to a, a wonderful, beautiful woman, my, my wife, Laura, who's here today. We looked a little bit younger then. <laughs> but I, I, I met Laura because she was the roommate of uh, one of my postdocs, and I'd seen her running on the track where I also ran. And so I, I, I thought she was very beautiful and stimulating, smart and nice. She actually has a bachelor's degree from Harvard and a PhD from neuroscience at, at MIT. And being married to someone with a scientific background was very helpful to me because she you know, knows the pressures I feel, but also the rewards I get from science. And being able to share that with her has been wonderful. Laura's my best friend as well as my wife. I've also been very lucky because Laura's a very straightforward person. I always know exactly where I stand. <laughs> she was even telling me what I should and shouldn't say in this talk this morning. <laughs> and uh, I should add that a number of years ago, my postdocs and students had a symposium for me. And one of them, Edith Mathiowicz, uh, made a graph of my productivity. And um, she asked everyone, why is there a big inflection point in 1986? I can't quite point but, to it. But, and she said, well, in 1986 uh, is when I met Laura. So then I guess I got more papers after that. Um, and we also have uh, three wonderful children who are here today, Michael, Susan, and Sam. Here they are with us quite a number of years ago, but now they've grown up and are in the audience. And here they are just a year or two ago. And I think being a dad and a husband and a father and a scientist, I feel very, very lucky and, and happy. You know, I, I want to just close by saying that throughout all this research, with its challenges, and as you can also hear, with also, also its setbacks, I just feel incredibly excited about what engineering can do to make the world a better place, and, 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 and at least in terms of what we're doing, hopefully transform healthcare. And I believe we're only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of using engineering and engineering principles for all types of applications that can profoundly relieve suffering and prolong life. I know I've learned a great deal from the challenges and setbacks I've faced, and if there's any advice I might give to young people, it would be to dream big dreams, don't give up on those dreams and recognize that conventional wisdom isn't always right. I feel incredibly fortunate that I've had such a wonderful staff at MIT and such super students, postdocs, and collaborators. I've also been so proud to see my students get such great jobs. Over 270 are professors around the world, many in England, as well as the United States and other countries. And I actually view my students and postdocs as an extended family. I'm so proud of them. And I wouldn't be here today without them and without the help from so many people um, here and elsewhere. So once again, I'm just so honored to be here today and to receive this and, and to just share my thoughts and struggles and, and dreams with you this morning. Thanks so much for having me.